Hello again. Uh, do you remember last week we were looking at this? Oh, this week we've had a um, bit of a heat wave in the UK. Which means you're going to the mid 20 Celsius. Very nice though. Uh, and it coincided with us having a nice uh, anatomy team day out at Rosili, showing some new staff members how lovely Swansea and the Gower is. Which if you've seen some of my other videos, you guys will all know about, right? Um, uh, so last week we were talking about neuroanatomy stuff that we could see here and a common thing that I get asked about is the, uh, the ventricular system, right? The ventricular system in the head, cerebrospinal fluid and the spaces that it's in, where it flows and that sort of thing. And since last week's video was long, I had so long I had to cut it into two parts, I really should pay attention to that I suppose, I thought if I talk about the ventricular system that'll be a little bit shorter. So we looked at some parts on here and I'll get that other, I'll get that other nice model. This really posh expensive one, right? And, and this is a cast of the ventricular system. Uh, and these brain models kind of come apart and they've got the ventricular system within them. So we'll see how we go, right? Do you know that the brain is bathed in cerebrospinal fluid? So the brain uses a huge amount of oxygen, a huge amount of glucose, but it doesn't have direct contact with blood and it has this blood brain barrier, which means that um, capillaries aren't leaky. The endothelial cells are stuck together tightly with tight junctions and stuff is actively transported across the endothelium across the capillaries into the cerebrospinal fluid or some of it passively diffuses the brain is floating in cerebrospinal fluid uh, and all those good things that it needs can get to all the different parts of the brain from it some of it just diffuses locally right from the from the capillary beds uh, we talked briefly about that when we were talking about dural venous sinuses the other week but in a nutshell the brain floats in cerebrospinal fluid csf and there are a number of functions. Uh, I think the one that usually sits in my mind is that the brain is quite a heavy thing, right? We've got lots of brains here and they're, they're heavy uh, when you pick them up and they're very soft. So actually they kind of get squished under their own weight and change shape, which is a problem. Uh, these are brains that we've taken out of people's heads, you know, um, and used for teaching. Uh, but your brain is also heavy. Um, and out of your brain come lots of cranial nerves which go out through little holes in the skull and you've got lots of blood vessels coming in towards your brain and go into the subarachnoid space and so on you've got and you've got veins coming out and that sort of thing right if the brain wasn't floating in cerebrospinal fluid it would be much heavier and it would squash all of these things so your cranial nerves wouldn't work and the blood wouldn't get in and out very well and you'd have big problems so the CSF means that the brain is a little bit buoyant it's a little bit lighter than it would be. Um, but also then, as I was saying earlier, the CSF is the way in which all the molecules the brain needs can diffuse to it and from it. All the metabolites go away and oxygen and CO2 and all that good stuff, right? So think of, think of the brain sitting in that nice pool of, a nice bath of CSF. Um, it does have some, you know, shock absorption functions and that sort of thing. And so those are the main functions of cerebrospinal fluid. Protects the brain. Um, removes metabolites and lets nutrients get to it and stuff like that. Where does it come from? Where does it go to? <laughs> There's another interesting thing to do with blood pressure in that the brain is inside a closed box, right? And your arterial blood is at a certain pressure and you've got to push it into the cranial cavity, but that's got fluid in there as well. So there's a whole other pressure within there. So there's, a, there's an auto-regulation of pressures to, yeah, so the blood flows in and out of the cranial cavity and there's the right amount of CSF and the right pressures and so on. And if that gets mucked up, so if the pressure inside the cranial cavity raises um, and becomes too high, it can impede arterial blood flow into the cranial cavity, sometimes happens after trauma. So there are a whole, a whole bunch of other physiological things going on with the CSF. Anatomically, we want to see the spaces that the CSF is within, where it's formed, how it flows, blah, 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 that sort of thing, right? Is that okay? So, cool. this is why I like this guy, right? So this is similar to your, 
your MRI scans, although if you see MRI scans, they should be kind of in that orientation, right? You should be uh, feet going that way. Anterior is upwards and stuff like that. Anyway, right, so we take some layers away and we start to see these spaces here, right? And these are the lateral ventricles. These are the first two ventricles. There are two lateral ventricles in the brain, so they're surrounded by brainy tissue uh, in the um, in the cerebrum, things like the corpus callosum and the caudate nucleus and things like that, which we're not really going to talk about today. Um, and they have kind of, can you see how there's this shape means that there's an anterior horn and a posterior horn. And as we descend, the shape changes a bit more. So here's the anterior horn and the posterior horn. And these lateral ventricles, these shapes should be absolute landmarks for you when you're looking at transverse CT or MR sections of the head. You, you will be looking for these, these lateral ventricles and do they look normal? They'll tell you the level you're at. Is, it, is there like a displacement from one side to the other? And that sort of thing. So you should absolutely recognize what the lateral ventricles look like if you're going to be looking at um, head CT and head MR radiographs. So we see these obvious kind of anterior and posterior horns and these are also called the frontal horns because this, these push in, the anterior ones push into the frontal lobe um, and then posteriorly we have the occipital horns because they're pushing into the occipital lobe but what's harder to see is is these lateral kind of these inferior horns here, right? So these inferior horns are actually pushing into the temporal lobe, right? So these get called the temporal horns. This is then a cast, this is a cast of the space taken from in that space. These then, these are the lateral ventricles. And there's that anterior horn and posterior horn and inferior horn, also known as the, the, the frontal horn, the occipital horn, and the temporal horn, right? And we can see on this cast that these two lateral ventricles drain to this space here. And this is what we were looking at last week, is this space here. So we've got the thalamus and the hypothalamus in the walls here. And this space that's forming in the midline is the third ventricle, because obviously the first two are the lateral ventricles, and this is the third ventricle. And they the lateral ventricles drain their CSF into the third ventricle through intra interventricular foramina. There's an interventricular foramen on either side, um, up around here, in the anterior part of the um, third ventricle, which is what we can see here. All right now, CSF is produced in the lateral and third ventricles uh, and that's what this this kind of arterial venous structure looks is here in the midline um, and and that's what we're seeing here in these lateral ventricles and each one of these is a choroid plexus so they're receiving there's a there's a capillary bed in there so they're receiving arterial blood and they're sending off venous blood and from these choroid plexuses they're producing CSF. So the total volume of CSF in the central nervous system is about 150 mil in the adult. And the choroid plexus is producing about uh, 20 millilitres an hour. Um, that's all. So there's a little bit of flow. The ventricular system is lined with ependymal cells. And the flow then of cerebrospinal fluid is partly driven by it being produced at one end i.e. in the lateral ventricles and the third ventricle, and then being collected at another end, which we'll get to in a moment. But also, some of these ependymal cells have cilia on them, and they, they push the, uh, the CSF along the ventricular system. We, we, particularly, whoa, sorry, we particularly see this here. So here's the third ventricle, this is the cerebral aqueduct here, and here's the fourth ventricle here, this space between the cerebellum and the pons here. There's the fourth ventricle. So we'll find a bunch of these ciliated ependymal cells down here, wafting the CSF down towards the fourth ventricle. From the fourth ventricle, we talked also last week about these spaces here, these cisterns, right? The interpeduncular uh, cerebellomedullary 
and pontine and prepontine cisterns. So these spaces here. So the CSF flows from the lateral ventricles to the third ventricle, down the cerebral aqueduct into the fourth ventricle, and then out from the fourth ventricle. Some of the CSF will continue straight down the central canal of the spinal cord, but not a great deal. Most of it will flow out through two lateral apertures and one median aperture. These used to have lots of interesting names. So for example, the interventricular uh, foramina were called the, the foramen of Monroe, um, and the, ap the, uh, the apertures, the, the holes from which CSF leave the fourth ventricle, also get called um, the foramen of Magendi and Lushka. Uh, Magendi is the median aperture, Lushka are the lateral apertures, M and L, right? But you don't need to remember any of that anyway. You can just call them median and lateral apertures. Um, and you can see them on this cast here. So we go from the lateral ventricles to the third ventricle, the cerebral aqueduct. Here's the fourth ventricle. And then we can just about see that here's a median aperture here and the lateral apertures there. So that's the CSF coming out of the fourth ventricle and getting into those cisterns, those spaces around the brain. So we can get into the space surrounding uh, the cerebrum and the cerebellum and stuff and, and do the job of the CSF, right? Oh. So in cross section, we can see that as we as we descend, we start to get the very thin space of the third ventricle, and then we get this little hole here, so here's the pons. This hole there then is the um, cerebral aqueduct. And if we follow it down, and we see the cerebral aqueduct, and as we continue, we get down to the, the fourth ventricle. There are the lateral apertures there. All right. And then, we go down to the spinal cord and the central canal. Oh. Okay, so we've got our CSF surrounding the brain. How does the CSF get back? Because of course we want to take this fluid back to the, the circulatory system, don't we, somehow? If we're producing new CSF and there's a flow, we need to get rid of it. Now, um, the brain is covered by pia mater thin connective tissue covering, and then that is covered by arachnoid mater, and in between the two we have our cerebral arteries and cerebral veins, and then that's covered by the thick, tough dura mater, right? Um, and the dura mater, we were talking about this, weren't we? The, the spaces in the dura mater make the dural venous sinuses, and in the dural venous sinuses we find arachnoid granulations. So this is the arachnoid mater, kind of blebs of it, pushing into these dural spaces. And it's through these arachnoid granulations that traditionally cerebrospinal fluid has been described as passing back into the venous system. It goes back to the dural venous sinuses and then follow those out through the, to the internal jugular vein and away. Um, right, if, we, um, if we get a skull, and you look inside the skull, you can see and you can see there's some real skulls as well. This is a plastic skull. You know, you can see the impression of, of blood vessels in the skull. But you can see, like in the midline, you can see the impressions of these arachnoid granulations. And, uh, and I've got a model somewhere that shows this. Is it you? It might be this guy. <sighs> Cracked me little finger. I crashed my bike a little while ago. Right, so we can see in there, right, we've got the arachnoid mater still on this layer. We've got some of the dura mater. We've got some of the dura mater in there, and you can see some of the, the little dots, the little impressions made in it by the arachnoid granulations. And that's what we see here, these little white markings here. These are the arachnoid granulations. That's how the CSF gets back to the dual venous sinuses. And they're very, very obvious in, in, in uh, dissection as well. Now, that's where, what, that was what we used to think was the whole story. Uh, and we believe that the brain didn't have a lymphatic system. So a lymphatic system is the other way in which fluid gets returned back to the, the circulatory system, right? But just recently, just in the last few years, um, a group of researchers have found um, a lymphatic system in the brains of mice.
which they called a glymphatic system because of the glial cells that are evolved. So it looks like the brain, the human brain, probably has a lymphatic system, which may or may not be called the glymphatic system. Um, so some cerebrospinal fluid may be returned to the circulatory system through this glymphatic system, through lymph nodes, through the lymph outside the, the skull and back to the circulatory system. And also it's likely that maybe CSF passes along some cranial nerve sheaths to leave, um, because these are covered with dura, mater and what have you to a certain point. So it might not just be the arachnoid granulations, that might not be the whole story. But there you go. So the CSF, the ventricles, the cisterns, um, the ependymal cells, uh, and all that sort of stuff. And that's, that's the cerebrospinal fluid and the, the importance of the ventricles. Of course, um, if, if that flow gets occluded, so there's some self, there's some auto-regulation going on here of all these systems. But still, if like the cerebral aqueduct gets occluded for some reason, maybe there's a tumour or an abscess or a mass or something and it's, it's squashing it and, and the choroid plexuses are still making CSF, then you're going to get a build-up of CSF superior to this point and that of course is hydrocephalus. Um, in, raised intracranial pressure, which as I alluded to is going to give problem, other problems, right? So the flow of CSF is really, really important. It's important that it works normally and it can go wrong. So remember, when you when you encounter patients with raised intracranial pressure and signs of, of that sort of thing, remember your anatomy of the ventricular system inside the head and remember the closed box and the skull and all of these bits and things that are going on in there and think about where you should be looking to find where the problem may lie, all right? Don't forget this is all squishy stuff as well and gets pushed around. Okay, have I ever done head and neck stuff? Should we do more head and neck next week? Um, I'm away next week at a conference. Should have time to record a video, we'll see. <clears throat> right, see you next time.